Even while we're separated, tuning in from our own homes, your presence and attention to this community are an invaluable gift. There are those among us who have endured a loss in the past week. May their hope be uplifted again in this community of faith. There are those among us who have struggled with hardship in the past week. May they find renewed strength in this community of faith. And there are those among us who have wrestled with questions that seem to have no answer in the past week. May they find sanctuary during their search here in this time. There are those among us who have cherished an unexpected joy in the past week. May their rejoicing be celebrated in this community. It is good to be together this morning as each one of us plays a part in building this community, this holy place. Would you join me now for a short time of prayer and meditation? Spirit of life, God of many names, mystery beyond naming. We gather in thanks for this good day. With spring around the corner, some of the fog of COVID beginning to lift, able to see a bit more light at the end of the tunnel, there is hope and gratitude in our hearts. Life isn't perfect ever for any of us, but we know that life abounds and it is good. While hope is growing in our hearts, we have suffered many losses this year. Our own community has been hit hard with financial instability, cancer, addictions, the challenges of aging, and so much more. So in this moment, spirit of life, spirit of healing, we seek your compassion. And may we learn to reflect that compassion a little more every day for all of our neighbors, every single one of them. We take a moment now for silent meditation or time to lift up the prayers of your own hearts. Namaste, amen, shalom, and blessed be. We Unitarian Universalists have a well-earned reputation for supporting social progress. Throughout our history, we have pushed the wider society and our own denomination toward respecting one another. As we heard in our reading, respect is no small matter. It's actually a very high bar. Respect means to look back, to regard, to seek to know more deeply. It's different from tolerance or acceptance. Respect is looking to understand the other and to understand the pieces of ourselves that shape our own beliefs. Respect is a bit of a project, but it is, in my opinion, the only way of navigating difference that has the potential for spiritual growth and truth seeking. This Sunday, as Black History Month wraps up and Women's History Month begins, I wanna revisit how our faith tradition has struggled deeply with what it means to build respect. Currently, the president of our Unitarian Universalist Association is a woman, the Reverend Susan Frederick Gray. 
over half of our clergy are women. That hasn't always been the case though. The road to respecting women in our traditions has been long and bumpy. Maria Cook was the first woman to preach universalism in America. She was born in 1779. The Revolutionary War was still in progress when she was born. Even in the midst of all the talk of religious freedom and human equality, universalism was still a really heretical idea. And a woman preaching any religious message was unimaginable. She fought hard to follow her call to ministry. It began early in 1811 in Pennsylvania. In her home, she led religious meetings for anyone who would come and discuss and pray with her. Later that same year, she was invited to the Western Association that was the organization of universalists in central New York state. They asked her to preach at the gathering and they were so impressed that they ordained her as an itinerant preacher. So for a year, she traveled universalist pulpits in central New York. She had huge followings, turning out more than other evangelical preachers. Some people just showed up for the novelty of hearing a female preacher. And it's said that she managed to convert a lot of those who showed up just for the spectacle of a woman preaching. After the first year though, Maria Cook's ministry fizzled. She tried for decades to build a reputation as a legitimate religious leader, but everyone lost out. Universalism just wasn't ready to receive wisdom from a woman. A far more successful early ministry came slightly later with Olympia Brown. She was born in 1835, the same year that Maria Cook died. Olympia Brown was a fully ordained universalist minister, making the, her the first woman to achieve full ministerial standing by any American denomination. In 1870, Brown was called to serve the Universalist Church of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Although her leadership was successful and the church thrived, there was a vocal faction that opposed her leadership. They even opposed her work for women's suffrage and she was forced out of that leadership role. But eventually she moved to the Universalist Church of the Good Shepherd in Racine, Wisconsin and stayed there for nine years of successful ministry. She retired from that position to focus her full attention on women's suffrage. Those two women garner a lot of attention when we talk about our history with women in Unitarian Universalism. We sing their praises loudly, but a more accurate story may be from a lesser known group called the Iowa Sisterhood. We don't hear much about them. This group of 21 Unitarian women ministers served churches around Iowa in the late 1800s. Back then, women were being ordained in small numbers, but they were usually given the least viable pulpits, the churches that no man would take. And that struggle for a solid ministry led them out to rural areas, especially in Iowa. So this sisterhood had a ministry style that was pretty new. They had a vision of serving a whole family in the church. The idea that the church should be used every day for all kinds of activities. Their success was a difficult pill for the East Coast denominational leadership to swallow, but they had a tremendous record of achievements, blending skillful preaching with business acumen and nourishing their rural outposts of liberal religion. It was an uphill battle, but progress was being made. Also in the late 1800s, the denominational organizations for women were taking root. These were a sort of women's auxiliary for Unitarian and Universalist denominations, and they did a lot of impressive work. They had international relief efforts in Japan and in the British Isles. 
They created all sorts of leadership training programs and religious education, and they raised tons of money to support weak congregations, ministerial students, disabled ministers. They also opened schools to improve educational opportunities for African-American children decades before the civil rights movements. Still with all these contributions, women played little to no role in official denominational leadership. And they were still just a tiny portion of the clergy. Their steady push though, prepared their, the way for the feminist movement to radically transform Unitarian Universalism. Feminism rolled into our faith tradition with great force, culminating in the women in religion resolution. At the General Assembly, our national meeting in 1977, almost all focus turned toward the relationship between religion and sexism. And our member churches adopted the women in religion res resolution. It called upon religious leaders to, quote, put traditional assumptions and language in perspective and to avoid sexist assumptions and language in the future. This resolution was way more than a piece of paper. It led to profound changes, including a radical rewriting of our seven principles. The rewrite changed the language from exclusively male terms like mankind and Lord or father to more inclusive words such as humankind to represent humanity and gender neutral terms for God and equal affirmation of female and male attributes of the sacred. The women's movement directly shaped the seven principles, our primary guiding document. And that's not all that the women in religion resolution achieved. Quickly after that, barriers to women's full participation in power structures were dismantled and the number of women clergy increased dramatically until by the year 2000, women were in the majority of our ministry. The 1980 National Meeting of Unitarian Universalism urged congregations to provide opportunities to learn about the sexist nature of our religious heritage and to change it. That ushered in a whole new set of religious education curriculum and the creation of the hymnal that we still use today. You know, that big gray heavy one in our sanctuary singing the living tradition. Our journey of respecting women and religion changed us profoundly. It's been a hard journey and such a gift. It changed our ministry, our worship, even our religious orientation. We have been transformed as a result of addressing the historic inequalities and sexism in religion. At the same time as women were transforming Unitarian Universalism, our journey toward multicultural beloved community opened this faith tradition to new possibilities. Joseph Jordan was the first African-American person ordained in our faith tradition. It's worth noting that both of these firsts, the first woman and the first African-American ordained ministers were in the universalist tradition. While our Unitarian forebears were steeped in reason and freedom, our universalist forebears found their faith in a deep and abiding love of God. Joseph Jordan was born in 1842 as a free black man in West Norfolk, Virginia. His early years, he worked as an oysterman, but he found success in carpentry and eventually building homes. He was literate, highly skilled, and a property owner, 
making him poised to be a leader for the African-American community. By 1880, he became a Baptist minister and shortly after that, after reading a book called A Plain Guide to Universalism, converted, he rented out a small space that he converted into a chapel with a pulpit that he built himself. It was quickly packed with worshipers. His congregation of 20 families organized themselves as a recognized universalist mission in 1887. Seeing this vibrant community growing and wanting a little more stability, Jordan sought to become officially recognized as a universalist minister. After some debate and probably some very hard conversations, on March 31st, 1889, he became the first African-American minister in our tradition. He returned home to his universalist congregation in Norfolk. They grew and succeeded largely during the week as an educational resource. They taught a day school for 50 students and this success though, it's important for us to remember that this was all a project of segregation. Local black press and leadership didn't quite know how to respond as the universalist denomination was still almost completely white. Their school program stayed strong, but the congregation lost key leaders. Joseph Jordan died in 1901 of an unknown disease. And without steady leadership, the first Universalist Church of Norfolk, an African-American Universalist Church and its day school declined and closed in 1906. Like most of American culture, we tend to celebrate the Unitarians and the Universalists who were on the right side of history but the abolition of slavery was contentious within our own faith. While some of the leading abolitionists were Unitarians and Universalists, both of the denominations struggled to make a clear unified stand on the issue. Most supported the idea of abolition, but many preferred a more gradual approach that would give financial compensation to those who were invested in slave ownership. They thought prosperity depended on gradualism and that the tactics of abolitionists were too disrupt disruptive. Some even subscribed to the wrong-headed notion that some slave, slave owners might not be so bad. They might even be kind. The issue of abolition brought potential conflict wherever it was aired. Ministers and congregations sometimes opposed one another, as did factions within congregations. You might remember the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 that required the capture of enslaved people who escaped and sought refuge in the northern states. Millard Fillmore the Unitarian president signed the Fugitive Slave Act into law. To be fair, he said he detested slavery and he explicitly signed the law to preserve the union, but this deep compromised position is part of our heritage. Fortunately, the Fugitive Slave Act turned the tide for abolition within both Unitarianism and Universalism. Fed up with the pace of change, gradualism gave way to a full-throated support of abolition so that most ministers in both denominations made clear public statements on the issue. And many, many of the nation's leading abolitionists were either a part of or closely connected 
to Unitarianism or Universalism. Along with our role in abolition, the second major moment of engagement with racial justice was the civil rights movement. In 1963, busloads of Unitarian Universalists joined with the March on Washington in the biggest civil rights demonstration in our nation's history. Two years later, in 1965, Dr. King was leading marches in Selma. In Selma, a young sawmill worker and church deacon, Jimmy Lee Jackson, was murdered during a voting rights demonstration. And a march was organized where protesters planned to march all the way to the state's capital in Montgomery. They were violently turned back by state police. We've all seen the images of this horrible event. And King sent a telegram to leaders of all of the religious denominations in the United States asking for support. In response, about 20 Unitarian Universalist ministers and some lay people responded to the call to Selma. Three of those Unitarian ministers were Orloff Miller, Clark Olson, and James Reeb. One night there, on their way back from dinner at one of the town's only integrated restaurants, the three men were attacked. In Selma, James Reeb sustained severe head injuries from the beating and died two days later. Just after the, the attack, the board of the Unitarian Universalist Association was meeting in Boston and the board members decided that they too had to head to Selma. They adjourned the meeting in Boston and reconvened in Selma. And a second wave of UUs joined them, bringing the total presence in Selma to about 200. All this and the martyrdom of James Reeb in particular led to the passage of long delayed Voting Rights Act of 1965. Our engagement with racism is a complex history. In the late 1960s, a crisis of confidence unraveled as our national movement failed to fully support the newly formed Black Unitarian Universalist Caucus. And the details of that crisis are way too complicated to describe here. But a quote from Hayward Henry, the chair of the Black Unitarian Universalist Caucus speaks, speaks clearly to that moment and our ongoing work toward multiculturalism. In 1968, Hayward said, quote, we Unitarian Universalists like to keep saying, but we went to Selma with you. Why are you Blacks rejecting us? In Selma, a Black man named Jimmy Jackson was killed. And at that time, you could count the number of Unitarians in Selma on your fingers. A few weeks later, a white man was killed and all Unitarians ran to Selma. Racism, that's what it is, he said. The history is complicated. The work of building respect and trust is complicated. The past few years, along with the national conversation around Black Lives Matter, we continue to struggle to address racism and to build multicultural community. At the national level, the organization that leads this work is called DRUM, which stands for Diverse Revolutionary Unitarian Universalist Multicultural Ministries. We do love our acronyms. DRUM is supported in their work 
by the organization Allies for Racial Equality. One of the opportunities for building trust and respect that many congregations are discussing is the addition of an eighth principle. You may have heard murmurings of this. This year, 30 different congregations voted to affirm this eighth principle. It reads, we, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote journeying toward spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. I'm going to read that one more time. We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote journeying toward spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismant dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. I know I have crammed a lot into one short sermon. I hope that some of these nuggets of information inspire you to dig a little bit deeper. And I hope that this very quick survey of our struggle of learning to respect one another gives you a better sense of who we are and the work still yet to be done. The women's movement taught us the journey of respect changes us in the process. We've done well with the virtue of respect because we've worked very, very hard at it. We've weathered tremendous conflict within our congregation and against the wider society. That work never stops. It's a journey toward wholeness, it's a spiritual commitment. Amen. It's the tradition of our congregation to share half of the collection on Sunday mornings with an organization that shares our values. This month, that organization is called I Support the Girls. Um, they give all sorts of uh, products to women who are in need of financial assistance, um, feminine hygiene products and undergarments and those sorts of things that don't normally get donated. So you can learn more about them if you just Google I support the girls and in the chat box you'll find a link to give online or by text. And now we extinguish this flame, knowing the light remains in the warmth and compassion of our hearts until we are together again. Let the good in us connect with the good in others until all the world is transformed through the compelling power of love. Go in peace and let the light within you be a blessing to the world.